Hi everyone, welcome back to Cast Career Prep, where we talk all about how to get you ready for a career in arts, humanities, and social sciences. I'm Nicole McDavid, and in today's episode, we will be talking all about brand building. To discuss this topic, we have professional Duania Wilkerson here with us today. In 2016, after teaching English at a local university for 11 years, Duania traded her gradebook and dry erase markers for a laptop in coffee shops. I love that. I was working in a coffee shop earlier. It was fabulous. That was the start of Pros and Pens, a ghostwriting and brand messaging service that helps leaders and entrepreneurs create content to build their professional brands. It is great to have you here, Duania. Thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. I'm excited about being here. So let's jump into the questions. And this is a, a big one that we're starting with. What okay. is the importance of brand building? That's kind of a, a very uh, large umbrella of, of information. Yes. So, well, my first, I have a question back. Sure. Um, are we talking about personal branding? or business branding? I think that's a good question mm -hmm. that you have. And I feel like it might help students to talk a little bit about both. Okay. Because for our students, when they are first coming out of college and, and going into that first job, mm -hmm. I think that that kind of personal brand building is so mm -hmm. incredibly important. And something that many students may not even think about, like who am I kind of as, as a, a brand and what am I trying to promote? But I think it also is helpful to students, especially for our students that are maybe interested in doing freelance work or entrepreneurship work, to have a little bit of an idea of how you build a brand for your business as well. So okay. if you can talk a little bit about both, I think that would be really, really helpful. Okay. So first off, the importance of personal branding is, and I'll use myself as an example. Yeah. When I got my first real job, um, as an instructor at a university, I had no clue what I was doing, of course. And so a more senior colleague decided that she would be my mentor. And I was excited because I'd never had a mentor. And I noticed at some point that we would always be the two people who were showing up late to meetings. Um, we would be late for our classes we she would encourage me let's leave class a little early so that we can go to the mall or we can go to an early dinner those sorts of things and so it finally clicked that i am gaining a really poor reputation among my colleagues and my students and that is never the way that i have wanted to be so that's when i first started to realize the importance of having a personal brand and so what i did was to first think about um how, the example i wanted to set for my students how i wanted to be perceived by my colleagues because i wanted to be um, respected although i was junior faculty um, i still wanted to earn their respect um, that was important to me and so that is when i first acknowledged this thing about personal branding and so for anyone who is leaving school going into the workforce personal branding is important because if you don't think about who you are where you want to go what you want to do there's always someone else who is willing to help you chart that path and it may not be the best path for you. Um, okay. I know so many people who have gone into job positions and they have accepted promotions or agreed to lead a team. And then they're like, I don't even really want to do this because someone else identified them as being a good fit for the opportunity. But once they got into it, they didn't feel like it was a good fit for themselves. And so that is why we have to, number one, know what we want and then create that persona, and I'm, I'm going to put persona in air quotes, um, create that persona that will help us get there. I think that's great. That's so important. And I think that many times it is something that you need to think about when mm -hmm. you do work with a mentor, because those opportunities yes. do sometimes arise, mm -hmm. especially in the college setting of, you know, is this connected to what I want my personal brand mm -hmm. to be and, and who do I want to be? through that. 
So kind of jumping off that idea and, and thinking about the, the business branding part of it, how did you build pros and pins to what it is today? Um, lots of legwork. Um, so in a community like Huntsville, it is very, it is driven by who you know. Um, and, and I'm only saying Huntsville because this is the place that I've gone to school, graduate school, and I am building a business. Um, but I've heard other people, most of us are familiar with the saying, it's, it's not all the time what you know, but who you know. And that is because who you know becomes your network and it, those people become the ones who vouch for you and mm -hmm. refer you and say, you don't know her, but I know her and you can trust her. And that is a very big deal. So the way that I started to build my brand here is I networked in person. Um, I know that so many people would love to only hang out online and online networking does have, have its benefits, but there is something really special and, and valuable about networking in person. So I did network in person. I joined organizations and I joined organizations that um, I thought would help position me as a leader, number one, and that would put me in contact with uh, my a potential client. So, and I would say the, the greatest, um, the greatest thing that has given me success in business is being up close and personal with people so that they have an opportunity to know me. Um, I, when I think about business brands, just like with personal branding, I always think about reputation. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of who we trust is based on the reputation of their brand. Um, if, I won't go into that, I'll say that for later. But <laughs> it's about building reputation and the best way to get your reputation out there is to network in person, be seen and be heard. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's a really important tip. And one of the things I would really love for you to share, mm -hmm. because you shared this at the, um, design week symposium that we had at UAH. And even though we're not specifically talking about networking today, you talked about your strategy for networking mm -hmm. because you said that you are an introvert. Mm -hmm. And so networking was really difficult. And I would love if you would share that for students because it was such an incredibly insightful tip that you gave for how you go about going into events and, and networking and what you did. Okay. So when I first started the business, I did not have a mentor. I did not have any contacts because everything I knew was in education. And so everyone and everything was left there. And so I was literally starting from scratch and building my business. And I knew that I would have to network. I had no clue how to do it. So I Googled how to network, like literally how to network. and. I went through all of these blogs and um, business blogs and personal blogs that people had written about networking. And I wrote down a list of, I think about 10 things. And in writing down those 10 things, I was able to make a list. I felt like, okay, this is what I can do. This is how I can make networking easier for me. So what I did was that I would make a goal to attend at least two events per week. For each of those events, I will go online because so many organizations now publish their, um, their list of attendees. And so I would look at that list of attendees and I would choose two people that I would hope to meet. And I would say that I'm going to make contact. If I don't make contact with anybody else, I'm going to make contact with these two people. Um, and so I would go to the event, I would wander around until I was able to locate those two people or at least one of them. And I would introduce myself, which was way out of my comfort zone, um, and make some sort of conversation or even small talk, if you will. But it was just the point of me, number one, practicing being out in public getting out of my shell and meeting people. And once I made contact with that person or those two people, I would give myself permission to leave. 
So it didn't matter if that if that happened in 15 minutes time or 30 minutes time or an hour. Once I could check that off my list, my networking list, then I would give myself permission to head home. And that is how I began to get more comfortable networking and meeting people. I just think that's such great advice because it gives a really specific mm -hmm. goal and it gives you the ability to say, once you've met that goal, then you give yourself that permission that you can go. And I'm assuming that like as time went on and you were doing that, you would then end up staying yes. longer. Yeah. Now I can stay for hours. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's so great about it because it kind of does like this small building process mm -hmm. to help you get used to it and kind of moves you, you through it in a way that is more tangible and yes. easy to achieve. So when you were building your brand, did you experience any setbacks during that time? And if so, how did you overcome them if you did? So many setbacks. Um, so one was when I taught there were, anytime you work in an environment that is structured, you know what to do. You know what time you have to be at work. You know what, what your um, responsibilities are for the day. You know who you're meeting with for the week and when you start a business especially solo you have absolutely no structure yeah and so i would wake up in the mornings like okay what am i doing today yeah. i have no clue what i'm doing today so and if you don't know what you're doing today there's no way that you're going to grow your business you're not going to get clients you're not going to make any money right. so just imagine it um, so the first thing that I had to do, the first um, obstacle for me was creating structure. How do I set my day so that I'm being productive, so that I am networking, so that I'm meeting people, so that I'm making money? That is number one. Um, number two is one that I feel like a, many creatives, especially, um, have to deal with, and that is pricing. How do I... Mm -hmm ask for money oh, yeah. and how do I collect that money and how do I make sure that I'm getting paid on time and so that was a second obstacle I had to put things in place contracts um, I had to figure out an invoicing system I had to make sure that I was getting paid ahead of time for the work that I was doing and not having to chase an invoice after I had submitted work and you know, people weren't paying in a timely fashion. So though that was another obstacle. Once I got a client, how do I navigate making sure I'm paid in a timely fashion? Um, and then you learn, okay, I need to make more money. So what does yeah. that look like? Do I need to um, identify a new client? Do I need to change the way I network? Do I need to um, offer more services or less services or raise the price on some services. So I would say those were the three primary um, issues that I had to work out before I, I felt like, okay, this is a business and I'm running it. Yeah, I think that that's great advice because many times, you know, we feel like if we do have a setback that is indicative of the fact that we're not doing what we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. But I think when you expect that there are going to be setbacks, that's an important kind of learning experience and being able to move forward in yes. a way that is going to help you. If a, a student, and this is d depending on, upon, you know, what our students are particularly majoring in, but if they're going into a, a situation where they're helping a business to rebrand mm -hmm. or they're trying to save a business that has maybe a declining brand those i feel like would be very difficult situations how do you think they could maybe best practice work through that in a way to work with the company well and be able to also kind of bring in ideas that are going to be received because i think one of the main things that i think about when a company has a brand even if they decide they want to change that brand, mm -hmm. they still in many ways feel very connected to that brand. I don't know how many, like, I think of like commercial brands of, 
of places where they're like, we've rebranded. And I'm thinking it looks the same, right? <laughs> it's like you have rebranded the exact same thing. So you, you know, that's not really something new yes. or different. And so how would maybe a student going into those situations navigate that when they're going into the, the workforce and maybe don't have quite all that experience yet? So the first thing, um, so there, there are a few reasons that a rebrand could happen. It could happen because the brand did something awful and they need to recover from it. Yeah. Or there could be a rebrand because um, the the current branding um, feels, what is the word I'm looking for? It feels dated. Dated. And yeah. they want to update. They want something more modern or fresh. Um, so... The first question to always ask is, why is this necessary? Yeah. Um, if you don't understand why, you're going to be moving forward in vain. It's like putting a, what is it saying? Putting a lipstick on pig. Oh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm killing it with the same <laughs> Yes. Today. No, I know it's that. Yep. I know that thing. Uh, or you're, you're putting a Band-Aid on a. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bandit on the bullet hole. Yes. I think it's what it is. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And so you have to know why you are doing whatever the thing you're being asked to do. Yeah. So let's just say that the brand has um screwed up in some way and they want to recover from the re the rebrand is really about recovering. Then you have to first acknowledge that there was an issue or there has been an issue. Um, So many times brands don't acknowledge that there has been a problem and and everybody on the other side of the brand is like, when are you going to say something? Yes. Like we're waiting for you to acknowledge that there was a problem, that you screwed up and that you're going to move forward from it. So the first is acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Um, Secondly, think about those internal mechanisms that need to change. And when I say internal, that could have to do with the staff. Um, That could have to do with um, messaging Mm -hmm. that that starts from the inside but goes outward. Um, Rarely is it going to be about a visual rebrand. The visual rebrand is especially in a situation where there has been some screw up, a visual rebrand is going to be the least of concerns. Right. So it's acknowledging that there is a problem, um, changing things from the inside out. And then lastly, you can get to the visuals. Yeah. Because what people most want to know is that things have really changed from inward outward. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then the visual just becomes icing on the cake. Right. Yeah. And I think that's incredibly important. And I think that for, um, you know, our students that are listening, that is some homework for you because mm-hmm. they will they will remain nameless. But I can think of some organizations right now that have done that in the complete opposite. They have just rebranded and they're like, whole new, you know, uh, visual merchandise mm-hmm. and everything. And it's like, but what have you actually changed right. at the organization? Right. And so I think that's important when you think about branding, it really is internal to external. Mm-hmm. And so what internally is changing and then that external change is the icing on the cake. Mm-hmm. It is that last kind of reflection. And it's, you know, the icing on the cake, not like, you know, one of those Gigi's cupcakes that we used to have where the <laughs> icing was like this much and the cake was this much, right? Right. Balance, definitely balance. How does your own image affect your brand? How much, and and kind of in your brand of Mm -hmm. um, pros and pins, do you feel like that is something separate that you created or how much of it is kind of your imaging of you within that brand that, that you built? Um, so I don't know if this is a pro or con, um, it depends on who you ask, but I am certainly a central part of my brand. Yeah. That, that people work with me. 
Right. Um, the name of the business is Pros and Pins, but people don't work with Pros and Pins, they work with me. Right. Although I do have help from um, writers and editors on my team, it, 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 it I am the brand. Um, and so what I learned pretty early on is that when I started my business, I felt like, okay, now I'm in, I'm in business and I have to be very um, buttoned up. I have to wear my gray slacks and my <laughs> button down shirt. And I would just walk into a room very um, put together and buttoned up in a smaller version of who I actually am. And not only did that feel terrible for me, I also attracted clients who were very buttoned up and um, that is not who I am at all. Yeah. And so at some point, um, I'm going to say around 2020, as we were coming out of the pandemic or in the pandemic and I had a lot of time to think, I was like, I don't want to continue operating in this way. I want to be myself. If I want to look very buttoned up one day, that's fine. But if I want to be a, a little bit more relaxed, um, I want to to grant myself the liberty to do that too. Yeah. Um, I'm a very outspoken and opinionated person and I want to be able to showcase that part of myself. Um, and I found that when we went back out into the world and I showed up more fully as myself, I attracted more clients who were the same way. They appreciate my opinions. They appreciate me being direct with them. They appreciate me being honest. And those are the people I like to work with. So my personal image has, has played, I would say, um, the greatest part in growing my brand um, because I attract those people that I want to work with. And then they in turn refer more of the same people to me. Mm -hmm. And so when I get those, typically now when people contact me, I don't have to do tons of selling, which is great because I'm horrible at selling. <laughs> um, so I don't have to do tons, tons of selling because they've already been primed by whoever referred them. Yeah. And so Long story short, I feel like I've gone really on and on about that, but who oh, I am great. has played such a large role in yeah. the growth of my business. I think that's so true. And it is something that translates into so many different areas. I think of that when I first started teaching, when I started mm -hmm. teaching, I was almost the same age as my students. And so I very much, isn't that, it's, yeah. it's crazy. <laughs> they stay the, we stay the same age, but they get younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what <laughs> happens. That's, that's what happens. But it is a situation where I remember so distinctly, I had this idea, like, because I was so close in age to my students, I thought I need to be super professional. Yes. And so I was very professional when I first started and I was very reserved and I, you know, would walk into the mm -hmm. room in my very high heels and I would stand at the front and I would lecture for an hour and then I would walk out of the room. And I still remember getting like my first batch of student instructor evaluations mm -hmm. and thinking, oof, mm -hmm. like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna reveal the content of them, but it was an oof. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is not me mm -hmm. and this is not reflecting me. And I, I realized that and I slowly adapted it and I let myself in front of my students be kind of the, uh, quirky, yeah. humorous. I make jokes. I laugh at myself a lot. As I always tell my students, even if y'all don't laugh, you know that I'm, I'm laughing at me because I think it's funny <laughs> to me. And really let that part of me be part of my teaching. And it was amazing the difference in the responses mm -hmm. and even like just having students that came to class because students like wanted to be in the class and talk about the different stuff and we'd have discussions and sometimes we'd go way off topic you know but what was so funny is they would say somehow she manages to get all the information in there and i did and so it, it really is developing that understanding of of who you are mm -hmm. and also the idea especially when you start your own business it is nerve-wracking because you think i've got to have i have to have clients i've got to yeah. get paid and so figuring out 
how to be you within that brand that you're creating is so incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So when you're establishing and maintaining your brand, what are some of the kind of style choices that you make to maybe design things or set up things when you're doing perhaps, you know, promotional materials or even like the content that you're sharing with potential clients? How do you kind of make those different choices? So you make those choices based on what you're promising. Okay. So for example, I, the type of writing that I do um, for my clients, we work from three things, clear, concise, conversational. That means that things need to be easy. We don't want very complicated things. And so my design is that same way. If you go to my website, it is black and white. Um, the, the, the language is very clear. There's not much of it. Um, I'd like to think that the site is easy to navigate. People have told me that it's easy to navigate. And so every time I hear that, I feel like that's validation of the brand. Yeah. Um, so you are creating your visuals around what it is that you're offering. And I'm offering, I'm offering something really simple. I'm offering great content that is that should be enjoyable and it should be easy for people to read and so that is what you get when you get my um <laughs> business card I, I remember recently someone asked for a business card and i gave it to them and they were like is this all and oh. Like, oh yeah <laughs> like this is it this is yeah. the card yeah this is it um because there's so much white space on there yeah. and it's like is and is this where's your logo and i'm like that is my logo. It's a text only logo. Yeah. Um, so there there's nothing fancy or elaborate about it, but it works. Right. It works for me and it works for the people that who I'm trying to work with. So if you have a brand that's bigger, and when I say bigger, I mean bolder or louder or or, or that is offering a bigger experience, then you might want things that are more colorful, more in your face, more um, attention. Yeah. seeking and getting so you design around i feel like what it is that you're offering yeah and i think that that branding for what you are doing is absolutely brilliant because you are working with uh companies to kind of be their voice and help them find their mm -hmm. voice and do that writing mm -hmm. for them but then they're using as messaging mm -hmm. so it's so much based on the the text building content part of yes. it so to me that's a very uh unique and strategic way to help companies understand that when you you come to you which is kind of the point of of brand building how have you used media to communicate your brand you've, you've talked a little bit about that with the the business card and then with your website are there other things that you have done through maybe different social media outlets to help communicate branding in ways so when I started the business, I was on all of the social media platforms. It was Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And I was like, this is a lot, mm -hmm. number yeah. one. And number two, some of the traction that I was gaining on those platforms wasn't the traction that was going to turn into money in my pocket. Right. And so, I had to figure out where is it that I need to spend my time yep. um, because you can you can be on all the social media platforms, but if it, it is not contributing to your business in the way that impacts your bottom line, then you may want to rethink that. Mm -hmm. And so I pulled back from Twitter. I pulled back from Facebook. Um, just last, last year, I cleared off my Instagram, my business Instagram, and I only have personal Instagram, and I've been much more active on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, that is where I get the greatest engagement. Mm -hmm. um, if someone does contact me from LinkedIn, aside from the, you know, the usual, they're going to be in everybody's inbox people, they are usually more serious about working together. Also, I have um, 
gone back to my newsletter really oh, recently. Nice. Yes. Yeah. And um I have gotten I have gotten great feedback, um, open rates, everything from my newsletter because my client is the person who values information. Mm-hmm. And um they're not all the time on social media scrolling, scrolling, scrolling because they're busy. Um, but they do like to read and they like to learn. And so I make sure that there is always something that they can learn from my newsletter. So for right now, LinkedIn and the newsletter are most beneficial to my business. And of course, in-person networking, um, which is in media, but I feel like I have to say that because that's important yeah. for, for, oh, it is. for me Yeah. Um, and speaking. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's great. And I think that's something that's really important to understand, especially for students who are potentially going into areas where they're going to work in, let's say, social media marketing. Mm -hmm. If you're going into an organization and that organization says, you know, we think we need social media. And I've had organizations that have even come to to me and to the college and said, you know, we're looking for an intern. We don't really have any social media, but we'd like to get some (laughs) social media. Mm -hmm. And I will really talk to them and I talk to students and and tell them, you know, social media is not just putting posts up on Instagram or Facebook. When you're doing social media management, you really are figuring out what is the brand of this company and what different forms of social media do they actually need? Because at the point we're at now, there are so many different social media platforms that you Mm -hmm. could be on. And unless you are a, you know, influencer, you probably do not need to be on every single social media platform that's out there. And so it really is navigating that. And your LinkedIn, I love it because when I go to LinkedIn and I open up my LinkedIn in the morning, you so many times have like a thoughtful insight. And I cannot tell you the amount of times that I have written those down for students. And I've thought, oh, I need to make this into an assignment (laughs) for our students. Because I always always think in my mind of assignments that will help Mm -hmm. students or things that we should ask students. And, and you do that so well. And I think that's a great way to engage with your audience, but it also reaches beyond that. And so I think that's just a really effective way to kind of continue to build that brand, but also put you know thoughtful information mm-hmm. out there as well. Thank you for that. I think that is the educator in me. I feel yeah. like I will always be educated. That is, yes, once you're in education, it is very difficult to ever get out of of that mode for for sure. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. And are there any last tips that you'd like to give students? Um, yes. So <laughs> one is to um, be serious about what it is that you want to do. And I'm saying be serious, not in a way that you have to not be yourself or you have to be all buttoned up like I try to be, but to really think about what course you want to take, what path do you want to take um, and not be not be discouraged if it doesn't look exactly the way that you want it to look, um, because I tried everything that I could to not become a teacher. Yeah. I tried very, very hard. Um, and once I saw that I wasn't going to get away from it, I leaned in it, leaned into it. And now that I look back, um, being an educator has really been influential um, as a business owner. So I feel like when we are drawn or even when we feel like we're being pushed to go in a direction, um, just think about it, think about it, pay attention to it. And sometimes, you know, in the moment, we don't know what the payoff is going to be. Um, But when we look back, we're like, that is why that that happened. That is why I could not get away from doing that because it, it was meant to be to get me to this other place where I want to be. That's excellent. And that's such good insight for our, our students and anyone who's listening to the 
discussion today. So thank you so much to Duania Wilkerson for being here today to talk about brand building. We would also like to thank our sponsor, Blue Summit Supplies, for the wonderful facility that we are in and the resources to make this recording possible. A special thank you to our assistant media writer and researcher, Macy Morgan, video producer and editor, Jesse Hendricks, and producer, Grace Trutel. I'm your host, Nicole McDavid, and we'll see you next time for more Cast Career Prep.